Thank you, guys. Just got to check my voice quick. Um, that was one of the best introductions I've probably ever had. I didn't know it was a public confession about the man crush thing or introduction, but it, you know what? <laughs> Let's just see where the Lord leads this. So, as JT said, my name is Luke. My beautiful, amazing wife is over here shaking her head because she doesn't want me to just do that. There we go. I. I <laughs> Can we get a camera on here? <laughs> I come from Cape Town. I'm part of the leadership team of a Josh Jen church there in a suburb called Milnerton. It really is a beautiful, beautiful suburb. I have five kids and two dogs. All of you, as Roland said, are partially disobedient because the Lord says, go forth and multiply. And here I am living out the gospel. So I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer before we start. I have been staying with Kevin and Andrea, and that's been amazing, and they are my witnesses. I've been battling a bit of flu the last couple of days, and I was in the parking lot at lunch, like a bit dizzy, and like, I've got to find a pharmacy, and there was some beautiful gentleman parked in his car. Where is he? Is he here? Just put your hand up. <laughs> and I said, I, went, I said, sir, Sorry. I hate to bother you, but can you drive me to a pharmacy? I haven't got a car. My hosts have left me high and dry. They don't care about me. He preached on Friday night, and he came and did what he needed to do, and now he's gone. Please, sir. No, I'm teasing. I love you guys. And he drove me to the pharmacy, and I've I then got a couple of meds and all of that. So I'm saying all of that because if my voice runs out a bit towards the end, I hope it doesn't because I'm wanting to sing a beautiful song Overall, I'm teasing. I hope it doesn't. But is it okay if we just go for it in this last session? And if the voice goes and we get all hot and sweaty, it doesn't matter. We just end this weekend well together. Can we do that? As Emilio says, let's finish strong, guys. <laughs> Inside joke. Inside joke. So before we go any further, I am a big fan of living a culture of honor. And I want to take a moment just to press pause because we come here and we have an incredible time and we get imparted to and we, we get equipped and we, we leave our changed and transformed human beings. And yes, it's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in us, but the Lord uses men and women. And I always want to take a moment just to thank those men and women just for a second. Can we do that? Um, Russell over here and Jenny, who's not with us this morning, but was with us yesterday, you are two of the most incredible leaders. I was standing here earlier worshiping alongside you, and I thought there's no one on earth that I would rather worship alongside. I have worked, walked with you quite closely over the past couple of years, and for a relatively short friendship, we've walked some deep waters. You have been there for me every single time, both as a loving father and sometimes in a corrective way. And every single time, I have come out the better person because of you. And I am partly who I am. Ryan is partly who is because of you and your inheritance. One day when you stand before the Lord, with as far as the eye can see. So God bless you and Jenny. We love you. Come on, come on. I want to take some time, just a few seconds, to thank two more people. Um, when coming into Josh Jen and 412, I'm a, I'm a relatively newcomer, but I feel like God has been shaping me and molding me for this family all my life. He just had to take me on a bit of a journey because I had a lot of Luke in me that I needed to get rid of. But he brought me into this family. And when coming into this family, you know, you hear about things. When you come in, oh, this guy and that guy and this guy. And I heard about a guy, Ryan Kingsley. I honestly, I was expecting him to walk in in white robes and long hair. I was like, is this the second coming? I heard about the most perfect human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. And you know what? They were wrong. He's even better than that. I want to thank you and Lilani for who you are. And I have had the privilege of spending time with your two sons. And you can sit and you can say, Luke, I'm amazing. My wife is amazing. My marriage is amazing. But we all know where the fruit of your lives will be seen mostly. 
And your two boys, Samuel and Caleb, are two of the most incredible men of God I know. And I want to, you're my favorite dancer in the whole world. Do you know why? You dance like how I think I should dance. Like it's, like it's just all over the place. And, you know, I can't relate to the, that ballet stuff. I can't do that stuff. But I look at you and I go, I can be like that one day. And I think that's so important. You break things open for me. Um, I want to thank you too, Ryan. I think you, you and Alani are incredible human beings. Um, right from the get-go, I've been blown away by your love and your strength. And to, those often don't go very well together. Sometimes we're like m- nervous where it's only the father's heart. And other times you get guys where they have no father's heart and only the rod. And somehow in the Lord, you balance those so beautifully. And I want to, in front of everyone, say that this church, this region, the people of God are being shepherded by one of the most amazing men I know. And it's an honor and a privilege and easy, Ryan, to follow you, my friend. Thank you so much. Last people I want to thank. I want to thank JT and Cal and the City on the Hill church and for for hosting us for 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 making this event honestly guys it's been incredible and amazing and wonderful so can we just give them a round of applause sydney hill church and everyone who volunteered thank you so what basically happened is russell came to me earlier and said luke the day's gone a bit faster than we were expecting. We've got half an hour to kill. Could you preach? He says, we tried to phone Kurt Darren from Pretoria to come do a song. Kurt's not available in such short notice. So we're going to kill some time, Luke. He's like, can you juggle, Luke? Can you, what can you do? What skills do you have? So I know they said the best for last. But sometimes the best for last is just the last option that you have. But I'm here. I'm here. And if the Lord can speak through a donkey, let's hope he speaks through me. <laughs> but I want to say quickly, what an incredible time this has been. Guys, come on. Hey. Don't be familiar with what God is doing here in your midst. What an incredible time. In worship earlier, when Shane was leading so beautifully. Shane is one of my favorite worship leaders in the whole world. He is one of the most anointed and gifted worship leaders. I love you. And there's such a calling of God in your life, my friend. I don't know if I'm going to get to preach if I carry on this way. Hey. Um, and I'm standing in worship. We're playing all these beautiful songs. And God said, whispers this into my soul. Worship isn't a playlist. It's a posture. And sometimes we treat worship as certain songs we sing here. But in reality, worship is how we posture ourselves before the throne. So I want to ask you this afternoon, as we engage in our last session together, I want to ask you, could we posture ourselves ready to receive, ready to honor, ready to worship God with our hearts this afternoon? Can we do that? Beautiful, beautiful. Before we move any further, I just thought, I don't want to move on too quickly. I want to just... Gently just look back over our shoulder and just see what God has done over the past couple of days. It's been incredible. On Thursday night, we met as a bunch of lead elders and leaders, and Russell shared with us about God needing and the world needing bold and courageous leaders. Leaders that aren't afraid to go against the flow. Leaders that aren't afraid to be counter-culture. Leaders that aren't afraid of cancel culture. And I feel what God is doing over this time is equipping our hands, but he's also equipping our hearts that we can be bold and courageous in the world out there. I think Milani shared earlier about the boldness of God. And you see the disciples, they stand before the Pharisees and all the religious leaders, and they're not astounded by the miracles, they're astounded by their boldness. And they look at the boldness of these disciples and they go, surely they've been with Jesus. Look at their boldness. May we be a bold people. Signs and wonders will follow, but may we lead with boldness and courage. Last night, Kevin shared so beautifully about laying down our rights, and this is the gospel. This is what God has called us to do. Every time we get something, lay it down. In heaven one day as elders and and saints before God, we throw our crowns down. It's not a once-off thing. God, whatever you give me, I lay it down. I give it back to you. And I want to encourage us, even now, 
whatever preconceived ideas you have, whatever preferences you have, whatever it is in your heart that is preventing you from being wholehearted and fully present, lay it down for a few moments and allow the Holy Spirit to deposit something in you that could change the course of your life. This morning I heard one of the best sermons I've probably heard in a long time. Lionel, oh my man, where is he? Where is that handsome bodybuilder back there? That is one of the best sermons. I live in the love of God. That's, I mean, me and Merv, we sit in Cape Town and we just sing Song of Solomons over each other. I live there. I live there. <laughs> Honestly, my friend, that was incredible. And it was, for me, it was an invitation into intimacy and it was beautiful, my friend. Thank you. Can we give him a round of applause? That was amazing. Hoya spoke this, uh, this morning about living a sold-out life, pouring yourself out for Jesus. Oh, that is my prayer, I promise you. I don't want to be an eloquent man, a fancy, I mean, I'm, I'm barefoot. I'm wearing a cap. I, got to, I don't want to be eloquent and fancy. I want to be a drink offering that is simply poured out for Jesus. That's how I want to live my life. And Apostle Paul comes to the end of his life and says, I've lived my life. Come on, like a drink offering poured out. May we all just be drink offerings just poured out. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what it takes. And that was a beautiful message. And then Roland shared so beautifully an equipping message about digging wells and, and, and finding these enriching and restoring places in God. And this morning, we, in the prayer time before the today, we were speaking about how we feel God is calling us to pour ourselves out. Pour ourselves out. But here is the challenge. The kingdom of God is both dying for Jesus, but it's also living for Christ. The kingdom of God is both the pouring out, but what I am wanting to challenge every single one of us to do this afternoon is as we've poured ourselves out, let's pick something up for God today. And let's run like we've never run before for God today. I want us to pick up this life that he's called us into. Pick up this calling on your life. Every single one of you has been called. It's, it's in the process of being equipped. And God has a calling for your life. I want us to pick that up and run with it. I want us to pick up our cross and follow him. Pick up our weapons of warfare and war on his behalf. Pick up the great commission and go into all the world and tell it about Jesus. So over the past two days, we've poured ourselves out. But my prayer is that in this last session together, this last time together, that something inside of you would pick up the life of Christ and run like never before. Run like never before. Paul says, I've poured myself out. But he says, I press forward to the upward call, the prize of Jesus Christ. I run faster. I run harder. I don't look back. I keep going. So we pour ourselves out, but we pick up the cross. We pour ourselves out, but we pick up the calling of God in our lives. We pour ourselves up, but we pick up every weapon that we can to advance the kingdom of God. So are we ready? What I'll be preaching on today, no. It's actually true, though. Who here is ready to pick something up and leave this place a changed, equipped, and transformed human being? Put your hand up quick. That's good. I'm looking for the hands that weren't. <laughs> Elaine? Would Elaine put a hand up, Russell? Can we put the first scripture up, please? And he said, this is Jesus. With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom of God is why we exist. The kingdom of God is our reason, our purpose. The kingdom of God is our mandate. Ryan wrapped it up so beautifully the other day in talking about the kingdom of God advancing and going into all the world. And yet Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a grain of a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds. Yet, who knows that God is a God of yets? Yet. 
When it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. And it puts out large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. I believe he has planted 412 into the heart of this country at Gauteng as a seed of the kingdom. I believe that this is a prophetic picture of what God is busy doing here in the northern region of 412. Take a moment and take a look around this room. Literally, look to your right, look to your left. If you can, look behind you, look in front of you. See what God is doing. Sometimes when you're so close to something, you don't appreciate it for what it's worth. For us Cape Tonians, we barely ever see the mountain anymore. We genuinely don't. Someone comes out of town, all of a sudden, can you see that mountain? Can you see how beautiful it is? Two months ago, Ryan said to me, Luke, would you come and minister and spend some time with us at the conference? As soon as he said that, something prophetically dropped into my spirit that I knew was for this time and for this people. So I want to ask you, when you look at your life, when you look at your church, when you look at the world around you, what do you see? When you look at the people in this room, when you look at the leaders before you, the brothers and sisters beside you, the followers behind you, your sons and daughters, what do you see? Do you see just another church gathering, just another group of people, or are you seeing a seed the size of a mustard seed, planted where it needs to be planted, and growing in the Lord to become the largest tree? I want to tell you what I see. I see a people devoted to God, devoted to one another, and devoted to telling the world about Jesus. I see a people readying and preparing the bride of Christ in anticipation for his return. I see a people pulling down high places and lifting up the name of Jesus. I see a people burning on fire for Jesus like never before, rapidly spreading across this country like a wildfire. You've got to see it. You've got to see it. I see a people rising up and walking in the fullness of everything God has for them. I see a people equipping the saints, restoring the church, and advancing the kingdom of God. I see a people being sown as a seed of righteousness, of peace, and of joy deep into the heart of this country so that springs of living water will burst forth and flow. I see a people sown as a seed into the heart of this country that will transform this region, that will impact the nation, and that will increase from generation to generation. That is what I see when I look at you. What do you see? What do you see? Don't look at what God is doing with familiarity. Look at it with awe and wonder. And see not now the, this, this, the seed of a mustard seed. See the tree that's branches reach the nations. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 says this. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were noble, noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Give me your attention quickly. I want you to hear this. Another translation puts it this way. Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. Not many of you were wise scholars by human standards. Nor were many of you in positions of power. Not many of you were considered the elite when, God, when you answered God's call. But God chose those whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. God chose the powerless to shame the high and mighty. This is how the kingdom of God works. Kevin said it so beautifully, how God took an overlooked, underestimated shepherd boy and made him the king of the greatest nation on earth. How God took a disillusioned, orphaned son rambling in the wilderness and called him and said, Moses, stand before Pharaoh and set my people free. 
God took a murdering, persecuting enemy of his church and called him and equipped him and appointed him and anointed him as the greatest prophet or apostle the world has ever seen. What can God do with you? What can God do with you? He chooses the unqualified and qualifies them. He chooses the undignified and comes up to you and wraps his dignity around you like a blanket. He chooses the worst and makes him the best. He chooses the least and makes you the most. He chooses that which the world considers foolish and shames the wisdom of this world. How is a small group of people in a building going to change Gauteng? Well, a year ago, you weren't this many. And the year before that, you weren't that many. And the year before that, you were barely any. <laughs> but take a look at what God is doing. Because a mustard seed in the hand of the sower becomes a mighty tree. He takes the weak and the insignificant and he shames the high and mighty in this world. He chose the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. He could have taken any seed, but God was making a point. I don't look at the world the way you look at the world. I don't see things the way you see things. He chose the smallest seed and turned it into the largest tree. And I want to tell you, Mr. Kingsley, Mr. Fraser, and everyone present today, he has chosen 412 as a seed for his kingdom to shame what the world considers wise here in the northern region. He has chosen 412 as a seed of his kingdom to shame what the world considers as strong here in Gauteng. He has chosen 412 as a seed of his kingdom to plant into the very center, the very heart, the very core of this nation. He has chosen every single one of you present here this morning to be a part of that seed, to be a part of him establishing his kingdom here on earth. Every single one of you. No one is sitting on the bench. There are no spectators. Every single one of you are participating in the establishing and the advancing of his kingdom here in Gauteng. He has chosen you. With his own hand, he picked you. And he's taken you as a group of people and he's planted you and buried you into the heart of this nation, into the bloodline of this nation, into the place where people consider it the most corrupt, the most crime, the most broken. He's brought this group of people, every single one of you, to this place as seed for his kingdom to be sown into South Africa. And my request to every single one of you, if God has called you here, if you believe life doesn't happen by accident, but that God is the chief architect of our existence and he is the, he is the orchestrator and ordain of every step of ours, if you believe that is who your God is, then he has placed you here, not in Cape Town. Not in Durban. He's placed you here in this region because he wants to use your surrendered life as a seed to establish his kingdom. When this kingdom seed is sown, it begins to grow larger and larger. It becomes a tree so large that its branches stretch out as far as the eye can see. It becomes a tree so large that birds from far and wide come to nest and to build a home in this tree. This, my friends, is a picture of what God is doing here through you in this region. He has sown a seed of his kingdom here in Gauteng through Ryan Kingsley, through these leaders, and through the saints and the surrendered lives gathered here today. And the seed is breaking through and is becoming the kingdom of God established here in Gauteng. For many of us, we, we always speak about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is a place where Christ is king. The kingdom of God is a place where Christ is elevated above all else. 
The kingdom of God is where Christ is seated on the throne, nothing else. The kingdom of God is where Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, where Christ is the name above all other names. This is the kingdom of God. When we become a people that pull down every idol and every high place and we elevate our Jesus, then he establishes his kingdom on earth as in heaven. A kingdom is defined by one thing and one thing only. It is a king seated on the throne. And wherever that king is seated on the throne, that becomes his kingdom. That is where he establishes himself. That is where he builds his people, provides and protects and establishes and builds kingdom culture on earth. You might want to know why there's an area of your life that isn't blessed. God, is, there's something wrong with this area of my life. It's because Christ is not on the throne in that area of your life. And many of us here today, Jesus is on the throne of your heart, yes, but there are parts of your heart that might be your finances, it might be your career, it might be your kids, there are parts of your heart where he isn't set above all, where he isn't throned above all, where his name isn't above all, and as, as long as those priorities are out of order, the kingdom cannot occupy that space. The kingdom of God is simply wherever we put Christ on the throne. So like this tree, with its branches stretched out, with birds far and wide coming to the nest, as we sit here, as we speak, every day we live, every day we breathe, every day we move, this kingdom is expanding. This kingdom is increasing. This kingdom is advancing. The kingdom of God doesn't, doesn't sleep. It doesn't wait. It doesn't retreat. It advances. It increases. And it increases in your heart and in my heart. And as I allow the kingdom of God to increase within me, it begins to increase around me. The kingdom of God. Revelation 11 verse 15 puts it this way. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Christ. And until that happens, we will not sleep, we will not slumber, we will not wait. We will continue moving forward and advancing until everywhere I look, as far as the eye can see, Christ is on the throne. The kingdom needs to advance, it needs to expand, it needs to increase until the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other high place besides his throne. And there is no other name besides Jesus. And there is no other Lord and King but just Jesus. Come on. You're a part of what God is doing here on earth. And you might be like the mustard seed this morning or this afternoon saying, well, what do I have to offer in the hands of the sower? That simple seed becomes a mighty tree. Come on. The world needs, Gauteng needs, the northern region needs the kingdom of this world to become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. That's what we need. And what we will see from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, God doesn't have a magic wand. That's not how God works. Where there's a need, God sows a seed. Where there is a need, God doesn't come with a magic wand. He says, I'm sending a man. I'm sending a woman. And I'm sowing him into the situation. I'm planting a seed. God answers our need by sowing seed. The kingdom of God needs to advance. It needs to grow. And we are the seeds he's chosen. We are the seeds that he will plant into homes, into businesses, into schools, until those seeds begin to grow and become mighty trees. Until the kingdom of this world becomes his kingdom. 
And God has planted you as a seed of his kingdom in your work, in your school, in your church, in your family. Wherever you go, you are carrying the kingdom of God. Wherever you go, you are a seed bearer of the kingdom of God. We are the seeds that he's chosen to sow. Where there is a need, God plants a seed. Israel had been in captivity. For 400 years, Israel were in captivity, enslaved by Pharaoh, enslaved by Egypt. No hope, no solution, no way out. They couldn't ask anyone. They couldn't turn to the left or the right. Israel had a need. And God planted a seed called Moses into the heart of Egypt. And he knew that even though at first it was a simple little boy in a, in a little reed basket floating down a river, an insignificant little boy that would slip in unnoticed, he knew that if that seed just grew, it would become the mighty tree that would stand before Pharaoh and one day say, let my people go. God has called you to be a seed. God took an insignificant, overlooked shepherd boy. Israel will be attacked by the Philistines. The giant Goliath standing before them, killing them, slaughtering them, destroying them. Israel had a need and God planted a seed. He called a little boy named David and put his spirit in David and put his favor on David. And when David began to grow, he became a mighty tree that stood before the entire Philistine nation and destroyed the enemy, a simple seed. The city of Jerusalem, the holy city, had been attacked. The walls had been broken down. They had no way of protecting themselves. They had no way of defending themselves. Israel, Jerusalem were in need. And God whispered into the heart of a young man named Nehemiah. And took Nehemiah and planted him as a seed in this need. And Nehemiah became obsessed, consumed by one thing, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. There is need everywhere around us. And God wants to use you and your surrendered life as the seed to answer for that need. I could speak of Joseph being sown as a seed into the heart of Egypt. I could speak of Daniel being sown as a seed before King Nebuchadnezzar. I could speak of Paul, the greatest apostle that has ever lived. Paul gets arrested and thrown in prison, taken to Rome. Rome was the center of the universe at that stage. The biggest, most influential city on earth. Every Christian, every Gentile, every Jew, every Greek, every person around the known world had seen Paul in shackles put into this prison. The world looked and saw Paul in prison. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. God looks and says, I've planted a seed in Rome. I've planted a seed in Rome. And from this prison cell, Paul began to stretch out his branches in Ephesians. Paul began to stretch out his branches in Corinthians. Paul began to stretch out his branches in Colossians and his branches from this prison, from this buried place, from being sown as a seed, reached the known world and still reaches us today. Where there is a need, he plants a seed. And you might be looking at your life and feeling, God, I'm under such attack. God, so much is going wrong. Put your hands, your life in the hand of the sower. Put your life in the hand of the sower and watch him turn your prison into a place of planting, into a place of significance, into a place of growth, into a place where the kingdom of God will begin to be birthed in you and through you in such a way that you will reach far beyond your wildest dreams. Here and now, look at me. Kao Ting needs Jesus. Come on! 
Your neighborhood needs Jesus. It's no point sitting at home, praying about the crime, moaning about the crime. Do something about the situation and the climate here in Gauteng. Be the seed. This region needs Jesus. This region needs restoration. This region needs revival. This region needs the kingdom of God to be established here on earth as in heaven. And what God has sent here today, every single one of you, he's got 850 seeds in this room today that have planted every single one of you will begin to grow and become the mighty tree that reaches into nations, the mighty tree that reaches into neighborhoods, the mighty tree of God establishing his kingdom here on earth that begins to impact culture and change the atmosphere everywhere you go. You are the seed he's called and planted for the need. The greatest seed that ever existed, without a shadow of a doubt, was a seed that God planted in the form of Jesus. God saw our need and he didn't respond with a magic wand. He said, I'm going to plant something in you that if you allow it to grow, will transform and change your life. I'm going to plant something in you that if you allow it to take root, will change the course of your life, will change the course of your kids' lives, will change the course of the environments around you. If you allow the seed of Jesus Christ to be planted in your heart, you'll never be the same again. There was a need in humanity. We were broken, lost, enemies of God, and he planted the seed called Jesus Christ in us. He sent his son Jesus, whose branches would one day wrap around the entirety of humanity, reaching across eternity to make a home for you and me. We are the birds that come into the branches of Jesus. We are the birds that find a place to nest. We are the birds that find a place to build a home, all because he was willing to be a seed. This morning, this afternoon, are you willing to be a seed? Are you willing to bring whatever little you have and say, God, in the eyes of the world, even in my own eyes, God, this is insignificant, but I trust and believe that in your hands, in your hands, God, the hand of the sower, that this can be something great and mighty and significant for you and your kingdom. But Jesus understood this more than every single one of us. Because he says this in John 12, verse 24, he says, he says this, truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, the literal seed of God, the literal seed of the kingdom. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. <laughs> Not only did Jesus understand that when there's a need, God sends a sea, but Jesus understood in order for that seed to truly bear fruit, the seed had to die. And Jesus says, where I am, there you will be. But you need to follow me to get there. He knew that only in the dying would he become fruitful. It was in the dying that he would find life. And here's the challenge. He calls us to do the same. For most of us, it won't be a literal dying. It won't be a physical dying. For some of us, it might. But for most of us, your dying is a dying to the things of this world. Do you know what your dying is? Your preferences. Hey, God, I want it this way. Hey, God, I want it that way. God, I think this and I think that. And wanting it on your terms, wanting it your way. 
It's a death to our own flesh that is calling you to die. It's a death to our own preferences, a death to our will and our way. As Kevin said, it's a death to our rights, guys. A life poured out. The seed doesn't choose where it's planted. It's the hand of the sower that takes the life of, life of Ryan Kingsley and goes, trust me, my son. Trust me, my boy. This isn't going to be easy. But just sit still. It's a seed in the hand of the sower that Russell Fraser sitting here 43 years of following the Lord and still he's fruitful because he's been faithful. Because he hasn't said God on my terms and my ways. He hasn't said God plant me there or plant me here. The seed has no say. The sower decides and as long as you're deciding, as long as it's on your terms, the sower can't use you because the sower is gentle and tender and kind and merciful. He's not forceful and he won't lord over you. He picks you up, the hand of Jesus, so tenderly and he says, if you would just trust me, I will plant you. And sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes, like Paul, the planting might not be easy. But often the more difficult the planting, the larger the tree. Will you be a seed? Will you allow God to use you? Unless we die, die to myself. What does Luke want to do? Who does Luke think he is? Die to my own preferences. God, I want it this way, God. I want it that way, God. In my timing, God. And some of us as Christians, we get so, so skillful with this. The things we don't want God to touch, we don't bring to him. Because we're scared of what he'll say. And then we call it stewardship over our finances. But it's not... You're just keeping it from God because you're scared of what he'll ask for. We call it, no, no, I'm building a career. No, you're not. You're just scared of what the sower will ask for and where the sower will take you. But unless we die, we're going to bear no fruit. But if you and I today say, I want to be a seed that expands the kingdom of God. If you and I agree today and we say, I want to die. And Jesus does this. He, he's in the garden, weeping, begging, pleading with his father. The Bible says he was deeply distressed. This is not a pretty time and moment in the garden. But he takes all of his faith and all of his strength and all of his love. And he says, Father, not my will. But yours be done. And he places himself as a seed back in the hand of the sower, knowing that that hand would put him in a tomb for three days, buried. But knowing that after those three days, that stone would be rolled away and the kingdom of God would begin to advance. The seed actually has no say. And if you're going to say anything as the seed, Isaiah says this. God says, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am. Send me. God is looking for bold and courageous women. Bold and courageous men. To pick up a weapon. To take your position in his army. To advance the kingdom of God. God is looking for shepherds who will lay down their life for the sheep. God is looking for you and me. And he's saying, can I send you? 
And all we've got to say is, here I am. I might not be much. I might not have a lot to offer, but here I am. Send me. And this should be our cry. Here I am. Sow me.